Well, uh, good, uh, good day, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us. We're going to start our Perspectives in Investment panel. And we have a uh, distinguished uh, list of panelists here that represent uh, different cornerstones and aspects of the investment community. But before we dive in, um, we're gonna, I would like to at least set the stage a little bit. And I think uh, those of you in the room who were at the Space Investment Summit on uh, Monday, which we did, I gave a brief overview that kind of tried to at least segment the new space industry into various buckets, if you will. And I thought I would lead with that before we launch into uh, our discussion as panelists. So let's uh, go ahead and continue. Let's see here. Yeah, so I, I feel strongly that we're kind of in the middle of an inflection point um, right now in the, in the space industry. So the 10-year the span from 2015 to 2025 represents a, an inflection point that we have never seen before in the industry, something broadly new that has never occurred before. Dozens of companies becoming viable, Dozen, dozens of investors jumping in. Companies that become viable become synergistic uh, with other companies that bring up those companies as well. A rising tide essentially lifts all ships. And so what does that mean for us as far as investment and how do we break this down? So I generally like to view the the space industry or the new space industry in terms of several sectors or buckets, if you will. And these things can be called different, uh, different components or different uh, sectors of the new space industry. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, if you go to the top left, launch systems, satellites, orbital stations below that, um, infrastructure in both LEO and potentially off-planet, Earth hardware on the bottom, left there um, refers to ground stations and the equipment needed to bring data back from space. Everything on the right side of that slide are things that I classify as downstream things in the industry. So these are things that uh, take data or communications from space, translate them into useful applications, um, and are one step closer to the end user than the boxes on the left side of that slide. And another way to look at it is in terms of these classification. So a lot of folks talk about upstream and downstream areas of new space. I call them infrastructure and application areas of new space. And it's a very loose, uh, rough classification, if you will, on the things that are occurring within our industry right now. Now, why is this important? Because I feel that each one of these boxes, and you can, we can call them different names, but generally speaking, these are kind of the sectors of the industry have different dynamics at play. And investors, I think, view these boxes with different lenses and have different investment criteria for them as well. And so one of the themes we're going to discuss today is how our industry is actually not that new. It is relatively, um, the dynamics are not new. We've seen these dynamics before in other industries. And one other industry we've seen this in um, is, let's go ahead and skip that is the web 1.0 or internet industry and how that evolved into the web 2.0 or the mobile industry. So all the companies you see on the left here, um, some of you are quite familiar with them, but are traditionally known as kind of the infrastructure companies in the internet or web 2.0 areas. They created the hardware, the pipes, the, uh, the switches, the nodes, the servers, the chipsets, that the zeros and ones of the internet industry travel on. They're the pipes for the zeros and ones of the internet industry, if you will. The, these companies back in the, starting in the mid 90s, um, all the way through to modern day, uh, set the infrastructure or foundation for the entire internet slash web, web 2.0 industry that we take for granted. The companies on the right are the application companies of that industry, uh, both Web, web 1.0 and 2.0. And they would not exist without the companies on the left. The companies on the left wouldn't necessarily have a market to sell to without the companies on the right. It's a very simplistic but symbiotic relationship between the, these two boxes. 
Now, over time, and I, I stress that very, very strongly, over time, the companies on the right developed market caps and valuations and revenue streams that far outweigh the companies on the left. That does not diminish the importance of the companies on the left. Once again, they form the foundation, if you will, for several industries that occur in the companies on the right. So the companies on the right, just to kind of close up on this point, um, if we were to add Microsoft to that list as well, which is, I would define as, a, as an application company, they, are, uh, they represent the top six of the top 10 most valuable companies in the world are on the right side of that slide. Um, the companies on the left side of that slide uh, don't even make the top 20. Now, once again, that's not a, in, that's not a uh, I'm not trying to uh, minimize the importance of the companies on the left. They are a precursor and are strongly necessary for the development and the continuation of Web 1.0 and 2.0. How do we apply that same point of view to our industry? Well, we have quite a few infrastructure companies that are extremely viable, and uh, some are actually beyond the point of attracting investment. How does that dynamic of developing the infrastructure side of space lead to developing a foundation for application relevant companies. Now, I, I purposely put less application companies on this slide, on the right side of the slide, in order to spark a discussion. But I think we as investors and those in the audience who are investors, entrepreneurs, and industry folks, I think should, I'll put this politely, um, should spend more time thinking about the interaction between these two sides of our industry. Call them whatever you want. Upstream, downstream, infrastructure applications, hardware-centric, data application, and user-specific centric. What are the dynamics at play, and what are the synergistic qualities between these two sides of our industry? And as investors, how do we view investment perspectives using this type of mnemonic? And we'll get into that in a second. Um, Historically, most of our investment has been on the left side of that slide. The vast majority has. These are some latest numbers from folks like Space Angels and others that have put together a, a great list of consolidating our investment tallies for the industry. Um, the, the less than one billion on the right is a hell of a lot less than one billion. It's much, much lower. So there's a 10 to 20x difference. Why is that? Does that mean our infrastructure is not ready yet to support applications? Or are we, do we not find viable or compelling business cases that would fall into that right side of the slide? And uh, what does this mean as far as investors? So who, who, are, uh, who here are fans of the show Silicon Valley on TV? I hope some of you are. <laughs> um, this is referring to uh, the three comma club those who have net worths of a uh, of billion dollars, which obviously would have three commas in it. Um, the new paradigm that I'm trying to talk about when it comes to applications relevant to, to our industry don't require billionaires anymore. The capital costs required to develop an application-centric new space company pales in comparison to the exorbitant cost in, in comparison to uh, hardware-centric companies, and we'll talk about it in a second. So that was the overview that I gave at the Space Investment Summit. I thought it would perhaps spark some discussion that we can dive into. But before we go any further, I would love for the uh, individual panelists to introduce themselves, um, quick bio, but also give us a perspective on what your fund and or firm does from a strategic perspective. And after that quick intro, we'll, we'll dive into a series of discussion questions and hopefully have time from the audience to ask questions as well. So with that, um, I think Vincent, you're, you're up next. Yes. Can you hear me well? Yes. Good. OK. The green button. OK. Thank you. And it, I'll, I'll move over there. Yes, I move there. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so I'm Vincent Clo, uh, working for Thalesania Space. And I would define my role as championing new space in the company. Um, that goes two ways. It's uh, making sure we find and work with the best companies out there in the new space world. And that includes investing. I come to that uh, just afterwards. And also, it's about ingraining the new space culture. And I think it's really important to mention it 
within the company because this is how we think investment in other companies can work for everybody, right? And I'll come about it just after. So just a quick recap. So we are actually uh, by basically a satellite uh, manufacturer. So we are on the infrastructure side um, that uh, Amaresh was describing just before. Um, we go from ground to, uh, to, to space, basically, to exploration. We do constellations, we do uh, geosatellites, and I think we will discuss uh, that part of the market uh, probably during the panel. We, have, uh, we are in the different markets that you can think of, so Earth observation, telecommunications, navigations. And uh, we've got a new venture that uh, I will tell you a, a little bit more as well, which is a Stratobus, uh, on which we work with uh, others and especially a company we invested in. So it's a stratospheric balloon sitting at 20 kilometers high and which will be uh, available in, uh, in three, four years. So we are a big company for sure. I, I feel a bit like the outlier here. I don't know if there are other outliers here, but I'm surely one of them. Uh, we are basically uh, originally in Europe uh, and recently we opened a joint venture uh, through an investment with space flight industries down the street as well. One the, of our flagship investments that I will tell you about just afterwards. And for the record, so uh, we were talking, uh, you were doing the intro, Amaresh, about infrastructure and applications. I said we are focused on infrastructure. We have a sister company called Telespazio. Uh, which is basically focusing on the applications uh, side. So quickly, that's uh, just a few examples of uh, constellations we've been on, uh, including lately the Iridium Next that you may have heard of, launched by SpaceX, uh, just completed a few months ago. And um, I guess I wanted to go back to the inflection point uh, that Amaresh mentioned, 2015. That's exactly where uh, this whole story starts as well for us. So 2015, the realization we are a great uh, elephant. So what, me, what is an elephant? It's a powerful animal, uh, very smart for sure, but a bit slower, you know. <laughs> so the idea was how can, we <laughs> how can we run as fast as these guys, right? How can we run as fast as the startups? Should we run against them? Should we run with them? And uh, the realization was, OK, we need a dedicated structure that we call the innovation cluster at Thalassania Space. Um, important to share with you, it's really focused on uh, creating value from innovation. So it's not just an R&D shop uh, which is going to create, again, uh, mad science with all respect for the mad science, huh, of course, but really what's in it behind. And it works really two ways outside. Um, with, uh, you know, working with uh, startups and other companies on joint projects, on investments, and so on and so forth. But also inside, I was talking about the culture of innovation just before. Uh, basically, what we do, for instance, is having our own internal projects run as startups on which guys uh, are full-time for a few months. They can look anywhere they want. They can partner with other companies if they wish. And at the end of the day, either it's a business which uh, keeps on in the company or it includes a partnership or even an investment with another company or even we stop. So really, that was the realization. 2015, we need to do something about it. And for the last four years, we've uh, been uh, slowly and quietly progressing on that to basically come up with, uh, you know, a strategy. So that's I would say the holistic uh, investment strategy of the company. And you see all the angles, you see the internal, and there is also the external. And just to focus, so this is a framework coming from uh, Harvard Business School. Some of you may know about it. And it's uh, considering what is the core business for us. So as I told you, we are a satellite manufacturer. We are also traditionally, uh, I would say, a big satellite manufacturer rather than a smaller satellites. Um, and then uh, what do we do on the rest of the environment? So what is uh, close to us, let's say the small satellites, what should we do? Uh, if it's completely transformational, uh, you know, uh, deep space exploration of uh, galaxies in uh, tens of years, 
that would be more on the transformational. But to give you an example, actually, on the transformational, uh, for us, um, the optical communications, for instance, that has been, from our perspective, a transformational topic that we tackled internally. So as you can see on this framework, uh, for the internal, for the transformational businesses, uh, we tend to start making our own opinion internally. So we invest our own money in ourselves. Uh, and that's where we start to pick up and understand the topic and think, okay, what does it mean? Who are the people around we should work with? Then you have the core, which is a very traditional. So uh, just for the, for the mention, when uh, I talk about uh, internal mainstream, for us, topics like IoT start to be on the side of uh, internal mainstream. So we have a project, for instance, with uh, a partner on uh, IoT constellation. It's called Kineis with, uh, with uh, companies in Europe partnering with us. And then comes the external uh, disruptive, which we apply uh, on the adjacent businesses. And when I talk about external disruptive, that's where uh, apply the investments with, uh, with guys like yourselves. So again, an holistic perspective on uh, what we do there. Um, there are three ways, basically, we will, uh, we will work with people outside. Uh, with two different inputs from us. So there can be money, definitely. And there is also the in-kind part. So usually what we like to do is uh, starting with uh, r and um, partnership together. So we're going to uh, you know, work on proof of concepts, work on joint projects, um, or we will get the guys into our incubators. So we have a couple of incubators at Thales, one on cybersecurity, and that's where Kets a UK uh, startup uh, is getting involved. It's a quantum technology to secure uh, uh, satellites, basically, and the communications going around. Delphox, it's uh, an artificial intelligence startup which is incubated in Montreal, in Canada. And NL, it's another outlier. Just to mention, we don't close ourselves just to startups. We also sometimes can work with uh, bigger companies. And to give you an example, what we do with them will be typically we put pots of money from both sides, and we're going to have uh, you know, call for ideas for proof of concepts to basically understand what the startups do. Then from that stage, there are two avenues, really. Uh, the supply chain part, where uh, we will put in-kind effort to help the guys uh, mature and get into our supply chain. So that will be, uh, yes, a degree. Uh, such as uh, you have Exotray, for instance. So that's a propulsion company, Swiss 212 for additive manufacturing, and Emeria, uh, small satellites uh, on specific uh, French projects. And then on the left side, that's where, that's where the big pots of money come from us, usually. Uh, you see, um, I mean, uh, priority to the local guys. I think there is Brian on the right side. Yes, I can see him. So Spaceflight Industries, uh, which has been a flagship investment for us, um, completed uh, a year or so ago. Um, and to give you an example, what is meant by a strategic relationship? We invested money in their project and the company because we really felt this is a great, great project. But we also set up a manufacturing um, joint venture with them to be in the Black Sky Constellation. So, what it means is we didn't just put money, uh, we also put efforts, in-kind technical expertise, and even we help them on the go-to market to uh, basically address uh, whoever would be interested by the big product that uh, Black Sky is uh, becoming. CNIM, it's, uh, it's a specific technology. So space flight, I think we were at the series a COD, something like that. So, you know, it's rather late stage. Uh, North Star in between, it's a space asset management constellation in Canada, in Montreal. Same approach, series, uh, late Series A, rather Series B, I would say. Uh, same thing, we put money and uh, also setting up uh, and putting our expertise uh, to, to build up the constellation. And last one in the list, uh, CNIM, which is um, providing a technology for the Stratobus uh, project that I was just mentioning. Uh, which was uh, critical from our point of view. So basically, the way we approach investments at the company uh, revolves around these three avenues. 
Money can come in the different uh, bits, but one thing to keep in mind is we like to be involved. We, we are not just putting money usually, and uh, some people may like it, some others may less like it, but we feel it's important to be synergistic between the companies and ourselves to, to get involved. And last thing, just to mention, we obviously do that, uh, being connected with all the, the ecosystem. And of course, I mentioned my uh, fellow uh, panelists uh, today, but it's typically conversations with the different guys in the ecosystem that help us understand, OK, who is in the game? Uh, what are the different, uh, what are the different uh, strings at play, and so on and so forth. So that's for me. Thank you. Peter, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, so yeah. I'm Peter McCullough uh, from 10X Ventures uh, in Vancouver. Um, hopefully some of you heard uh, a bit of my chat yesterday. Um, uh, we, uh, Space is one of the five verticals that we invest in. What's unique about us uh, is our family office money, so it's my money and my family's money, as well as 300 other investors uh, in our group. Uh, so we don't have fun timelines. We don't have uh, uh, those kinds of commitments we have to worry about. And we also uh, are a direct invest model, meaning we charge no fees and no carry for anyone that puts in unless it's a specific mandate, which we have from a couple of different investors today, uh, one of which we're looking at, uh, interestingly, out of the Middle East, a $100 million investment into space uh, to place that for them. So, um, But mostly we're a direct invest model. Uh, as you heard me say yesterday, we really view blockchain and AI as horizontals, not verticals, meaning if you're not doing it, you're probably not in business in the next three to four years. Uh, and space is one of the five verticals that we're in. We see a lot of crossover between them. So we're taking hemp to space uh, in, uh, in uh, December. Uh, uh, but we, we see a crossover across all of these industries. Uh, we're active investors. So what's unique about us is we're hands-on, active operators. We run the fundraise process, which means we give the entrepreneurs back about 50% of their time to go do one thing, which is sell. Uh, and uh, uh, we're experts at scaling sales and marketing, experts at what we think is a really overlooked and misunderstood area, particularly in space, which is called business model innovation. And when you look at all those companies that we saw here that you saw on our maps yesterday, uh, our experience with them is that most of them are very old models based on very old assumptions, even though they're going into what is probably the largest economic uh, growth engine in the history of humankind, uh, but we're still applying the old transport model or the old whatever it is. And so we really are focused on business model innovation and we're experts at, uh, at scaling companies around that. So uh, uh, we met some great uh, people here today uh, and yesterday uh, and some, uh, we met investors, we met partners and we met two or three companies that we thought were really interesting uh, for us to invest in. So uh, I'm delighted to answer any questions anybody has. Great, thank you Peter. Uh, buddy, okay. um, Hi, folks. First of all, I'm thrilled to be here and uh, I'm sitting on the stage with some great uh, co-panelists. Um, I, uh, I come to this with sort of three perspectives. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a partner at Perkins Coie. It's a large law firm. I head up our emerging company, Venture Capital Practice, um, which currently serves as general counsel to about 450 VC-backed companies. Um, and uh, one of the many areas that we spend a considerable amount of our resource in is aerospace and aerospace related businesses. Um, as a corollary to that, uh, I've been dragged into co-founding a couple of businesses over three businesses over the course of my career. Um, the most recent uh, that I had a liquidity event on was a company called Titan Aerospace. It was a high altitude um, autonomous drone a project that we sold to Google about several years or so ago. And that led me to um, investing, uh, and I've since seeded about 42 different companies. Um, one of my investment themes is in, air, is in new space, uh, and I've placed five investments in new space, including leading the seed financing for a company called Spin Launch, um, and also uh, investing early stage in a company called Axion Systems, which is an ionic propulsion system. Um, it's an area that I find absolutely fascinating, and like my co-panelists feel like there's just an enormous opportunity if you have the right perspective and state of mind. So happy to sort of talk through those three perspectives as a counselor to startups, as an entrepreneur myself, and as an active early stage investor. Great, thank you, buddy. Uh, Lisa, please. Hi, I'm Lisa Rich, managing partner with Hemisphere Ventures. 
Uh, like Peter, uh, we emerged out of our own family office. We weren't a generational wealth family. Um, I'm a bootstrapper. My husband's a bootstrapper. We b built many businesses, and as successful entrepreneurs, we found ourselves in 2014 saying, how do we divest our portfolio beyond stocks, bonds, options? Um, where, where is there value to be had? And we stepped into the angel investing world and started looking at deal flow as seed investors and very quickly were investing in what we called our own S&P 500 index fund. So we invested across all of these sectors looking for value. And very quickly we had ramped up to about 200 companies we invested in and realized as that, uh, that, that patterns emerged for us as we looked at these deals across all of these sectors and the, res the resilient pattern for us was that we're at um, a point where the, the opportunity for small teams to have a great impact lies with those that can have the synergies that Amarash referred to that are really taking advantage of technology. They're adding hardware plus software to make a major impact. And what that meant for us was a, an evolution, an opportunity of the evolution of the frontier technology sector. So we shifted gears and said, you know, we're just going to focus on frontier technologies. And those uh, categories for us mean synthetic biology, robotics, drones, and space. Synthetic biology includes the future of food tech, it includes genomics, it includes blockchain applied to genomics and databases and health tech, uh, not therapeutics, but, but advancements in health. Uh, robotics, where uh, really these satellites flying around are, are all little robots, uh, so that applies. Uh, drones, which we think have a great potential, and space, which we personally were very interested in and we wanted to explore uh, what, what that opportunity um, would have as an investor and, and secretly uh, we were thinking about a space company. So uh, fast forward to 2017 and we founded I'm a co-founder with my husband of Explore, which is a deep space exploration company. We are looking to uh, take payloads to the moon, Mars, Venus, and near-Earth asteroids. Uh, and all of this actually, there's synergy with all of the things that I do. And I get up every day living in the future and embracing the future and seeing how humanity can push the envelope, envelope forward. and how innovative thinking can take the inventions of the day, innovate, and achieve great things. So what we've seen is that a small team can have a large, large footprint, and we love companies that can achieve major things with, with just amazing strategy. I would say primarily I'm a strategist, and I look at everything through that lens, and what uh, Frontier Technology holds for us is just um, the strategies we're seeing played out that are shaping the future for companies and investments we've had, like we'll probably talk about Axiom Space, the world's first commercial space station, Planet IQ that has high definition weather forecasting capabilities, um, Kubos that is flight and uh, software control, uh, flight and mission control software for satellites, and uh, Umbra Lab, which has the ability to have quarter meter SAR, the ability to see through the clouds, the ability to see at night. These are groundbreaking technologies that are going to transform the future, not just for space, but for so many industries that will suddenly have a space strategy when they didn't even know that there was an opportunity there in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lisa. And uh, Sunil, please. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I uh, run Ubiquity Ventures, and I want to tell you sort of why I started it, how it came about. Um, I uh, was about three years into Bessemer Venture Partners, big $4 billion venture capital firm, 50 people, uh, large organization, and um, we had invested in Skybox and it sold to Google. So at that moment, everyone around this tech VC firm said, hey, what's space? We should we dig into it a little further? In November of 14, we met Peter Beck of Rocket Lab, and he started sharing what he was doing with his rocket, payload, Leo, uh, et cetera. And one element stood out to me uh, really, really uh, uh, strongly. Uh, it was this notion of an electric powered turbo pump. Um, I, as far as I understand, uh, uh, the vast majority, if not all uh, uh, rockets use, uh, orbital class rockets use mechanical turbo pumps. And in that world, you are iterating at the pace of physical steel. 
Rocket Lab uh, at the time was the world's only company that was changing the way its rocket operated with lines of C++. Uh, that manifested in terms of CapEx as well. It might take $5 billion to build a new $5 billion or $20 billion to do a build or build a class vehicle. But Rocket Lab was able to go from uh, a very little to a uh, successful launch in May of 17, so three years after we invested, with uh, $20, $30, $40 million of CapEx. And to me, that was the value of software beyond the screen. Taking software, software development practices, the speed of software, and applying it to the real world. And that's the, the genesis even of the, of the name of my firm, Ubiquity Ventures. Uh, Ubiquity is a $30 million fund, uh, a one-person VC firm, just me. Uh, I usually invest about a million dollars, and it usually takes a week or two for me to go through my whole process because I keep a tight aperture on software running in the real world. What that really means is smart hardware that can be reconfigured on the fly, ideally lightweight, $100, $200 bomb smart hardware, or machine learning applications. So I have 11 investments that currently span the gamut from putting software into uh, training self-driving cars, software under robots, software under cows, software under scooters, securing firmware by scanning it for malicious threats, but all of this has to do with software not on a computer. And uh, part of the reason I love this conference in space sector is, uh, as Lisa was alluding to, uh, satellites floating in space are really just software orbiting the Earth. Uh, when when a, a Tesla is rolling down the road, it's really software rolling down the road. And so uh, I hope that uh, more and more space companies uh, are able to emphasize those elements of software design, capex uh, of software companies, and reconfigurability on the fly, both uh, while in mission, but even during the development plan. To be able to iterate at the pace of software changes dramatically the, uh, the capital profile and the time to market of a otherwise hardware company. Great, thank you very much, Sunil. Um, I think we should dive into a question. Uh, so we don't have Bogdan, so we'll dive into a question real fast. And Sunil, I'm, I'm gonna put you on the spot since you just spoke. So I, uh, I spoke earlier about this inflection point. Um, I strongly believe the years from 2015 to 2025 represent a monumental inflection point in the industry. In fact, the progress we're making now during this 10 year span pretty much will equal and eventually will dwarf all of the progress we made from 1944 through 2015, 1944 being the first time we sent a man-made object to space. Um, and so during that 70 year span preceding 2015, the progress that was made will be dwarfed by what's happening now. Why is that? Because a platform is being set, a foundation is being set, where new paradigms of blockchain AI and obviously software divine hardware is being set. But it also, our industry now is growing exponentially on the back of commercial enterprise, not necessarily the back of taxpayers. That's a, that's a big change. And so I want to ask uh, Sunil, and I'll open this up to others, what's happening now specifically that's causing this uptick in investment and this uptick in viable companies receiving investment? If you were to break it down to one or two or three things, what's different now than what preceded this current mm -hmm. time we're in? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. Uh, there are probably three or four simple trends. Uh, the, the notion of a CubeSat, you know, it's 10, 15 years in the making now but the standardization and the low CapEx profile of that, even recruiting, you can hire a CubeSat engineer versus having totally uh, custom platforms. Uh, as you alluded to, uh, the government uh, starting to become a product buyer as opposed to a funder of open-ended service contracts. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, um, and then we're starting to see the, 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 the circle of life for, for venture capitalists and startups is uh, closed whenever there's exits. So now mm -hmm. that we're with Skybox and others, uh, that uh, in 2014 has drawn a lot of the mainstream VCs um, into the sector. Uh, we'll talk about it later, but if anything, it's, it's more like we've had five years of, of great times now there needs to be results. But, um, a few, few technical trends uh, have come together to make this uh, renaissance possible. And you might describe that as a few million bucks, can, you can actually make meaningful progress in space. And that wasn't true a few years ago. Yeah, very good point, very good point. Um, Lisa, do you want to jump in on that, on that uh, question? What's, what's different now than, um, than previously? Sure, I think it's, it's really, th there have been a lot of people in the space industry for many, many years waiting for this kind of momentum. And it's, very ex it's a very exciting time. There are, uh, there's a lot to learn in this industry. There's a lot of moving parts and it's not something that you can jump in with easily because you need to know the players, you need to know the history and, and not just jump right in. But there is an element of FOMO probably, Silicon Valley um, wanting to get uh, caught up with, with space investing because maybe with, with e the launch of the, the boosters at the same time that was such a grand moment for all of humanity, they're starting to say, there's something there and I need to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. 
And th I think this, uh, great, great comments there, Lisa. I think this segues into what Peter mentioned earlier. And uh, you probably scared a lot of people in the audience, so especially the entrepreneurs, where you said, uh, if you're not well-versed and operating with blockchain or AI, in the next few years, you're pretty much out of business. Um, so tell us more about those two themes and how do you think it applies to space? Well, I think if you're a tech startup, uh -huh. Uh, there's like in the back, uh, if I look across the room here, most people were here at the beginning of the internet. I think uh, I can see the gray on the roof, so there's enough here that uh, we'll remember this. And, uh, you know, when, when in the 90s we all thought that uh, uh, this was just some garage thing and this was, you know, nothing that was gonna, yep. that was gonna make a difference. And what we realized was if you, built the absolute best software, say mid, mid to late 90s, if you were a software company and you built the absolute best software in the world for whatever you were doing, uh, but you built it on server-based software that you had to go into a room that was locked that only four people were allowed to go into and that's, that server, heaven forbid, never talked to anything outside of your company at all uh, because you'd never want to expose those secrets to the world. Uh, it didn't matter, you were out of business. It didn't matter if your product was the best, if your software was the best, if you had the best engineering team, if you had the best, it didn't matter because the whole infrastructure of the industry had shifted away from you from server-based to internet-based technologies and the cost curve and the opportunity on the internet side drove the adoption. The exact same thing is happening today in blockchain and AI. We are almost at the exact same point that we were in the 97, 98 timeframe with the internet for blockchain and AI. So it doesn't matter if your software is the world's best, if what you're doing is better than everybody else's, if you're a tech startup today, uh, you know, use history to your advantage. And the ugly core reality is in disruption, if you're on the old technology, you're out of business. It doesn't matter how good you are. And so if you're a tech startup today, and there's a lot of them in space, yeah. uh, then uh, you know, this is something that really should be something that's top of your, top of your list. Absolutely, no, that makes sense. I think, uh, where do you see uh, blockchain and AI applying specifically to space within like the next 10 years? Are there specific um, sectors or use cases that you see within the space industry itself? Oh, I mean, today there are probably 12 to 15 very common use cases in the world that big banks are using or large agricultural and trading uh, firms, shipping firms. Uh, so this is going on today. If, if, uh, has anybody here to show hands? Has anybody heard of a company called Ripple? Hand, show hands. All right, so here's a company that is replacing the interbank money system for one-tenth the cost in one one-hundredth the time using the blockchain. Mm. Those are compelling economics. I don't care who you are, where you are. Those are compelling economics and you can't compete against that if you're the current SWIFT organization, which is slow, owned by the banks, takes four or five days to transfer money and charges you hundreds of dollars instead of pennies or nickels to do it. Uh, so that degree of change is coming. Uh, the use cases are everything from ledgers to uh, all the way to crypto. And by the way, you know, crypto isn't evil, right? Crypto is one one incarnation of blockchain. So when, I, when people come to me and talk about blockchain AI, they say, well, you know, uh, isn't blockchain just uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum? I mean, isn't that really what blockchain is? Well, saying that is kind of like saying, well, the internet, whenever internet first came out, it was a browser, right? Remember Netscape came out and it was a browser and everybody said, well, that's the internet, it's a browser. Yeah. And then email came out and everybody said, well, that's the internet, it's a browser and email. And then all of a sudden e-commerce came out and said, well, I can shop online too. And, all of a sudden, everything took off, right? The same thing is going to happen on the blockchain uh, and AI side, and particularly on blockchain, because blockchain solves the three biggest problems the internet has today. It's not safe, it's not, it's not private, and you can't exchange capital in a direct manner. And those are the three biggest problems with the internet today, and the blockchain solves those three problems. It's the next three layers of the internet. And that's why it's so critical. If you're not doing it, you're going to be operating on server-based technology, in essence, in the, next, in the next five to seven years, and you're going to be uncompetitive is what will happen to you. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, let, let's shift gears into a slightly related but different topic, uh, the, the government. Now, I am a firm believer for small startups uh, whether seed or kind of series A stage, 
that spending a, uh, a large amount of time working with government contracts and trying to put, or at least trying to derive most of your revenues from the, a government source is kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Now, um, with no disrespect to any government entities in the room right now, <laughs> um, I do love my country, and uh, uh, if my, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going back to where my parents came from, if my president has anything to say about it. But um, Vincent, I'd like for you to comment on what is the duality, what are the pros and cons, if you will, of some of the startups that you're working with or invested in, and how they deal with the time and ROI relative to working with government contracts? Great question. Thanks for, for that one. So I'll take a, a global perspective as well, because I think you guys in the US are still very lucky with your government when you work <laughs> with him. Um, so the pros, I would say, uh, the governments are more and more supportive still, but they understand, I think, uh, it was maybe you, Sunil, we, we, who made this comment, but uh, rather than uh, just, uh, you know, uh, paying and asking the same requirements uh, that they would ask to a classic project, I think they understand that they need to leave uh, more space uh, without any uh, word game on that one, but they need to leave more space uh, with uh, loser requirements, uh, with just being supportive. And I can tell you that in Europe, uh, nowadays, the startups stand almost uh, a better chance on certain uh, governmental opportunities than uh, the big companies, basically. So, um, of course, there is the bureaucracy again, but my view, I mean, I'm a firm believer that, uh, you know, you have these uh, public-private uh, partnerships uh, in the U.S. which work very well from my perspective still. So you should feel lucky. Uh, I wish we had that uh, already working as well in Europe. It's in the making. Uh, but yeah, so globally I'm uh, rather uh, supportive of it. Um, the negativity is of course I can understand for a private investor and therefore for the startups uh, to access and to uh, uh, sorry, for a private investor to be uh, excited about the business which would be too much geared towards, uh, towards governments, well, that, that can be a difficult uh, sell. I can, I can get that. But, uh, you know, uh, I I'm very positive about the trend, Amaresh, on my side. Um, I see the governments uh, globally supportive for startups, uh, going in the right direction, understanding the benefit they have in supporting not only the traditional player, but also the startups. And uh, yeah, it should uh, keep on. And for us, actually, it makes a more challenging job for the traditional guys, to be honest. So ah, good. Good to hear. So, uh, you know, I see it positive for the startups on my side. Good. There's a, a, a secondary view of this um, topic, and Lisa, you and I were talking about this recently, about how startups, especially venture backed startups, um, can, do, uh, can make their lives a lot easier with having a good government policy in place having strong connections with uh, stakeholders and government that help set the foundation or policy that's relative to their business. Um, Lisa, could you briefly comment on that aspect of government relationships? Sure, I think that uh, in the U.S. we've seen just visiting this, the Space Enterprise Summit in D.C. the other week, uh, it was really a positive momentum that we came back with um, hearing from Jim Bridenstine and Scott Pace and Kevin O'Connell, the head of the Space Commerce Department. They want to work with small companies. They want to say, what do you need and how can we help you? And they're, at least in terms of our company, they're opening the doors and saying, let's have those conversations and tell us what you need. Because in some cases, they don't know what they need in regula regulatory, we found ourselves defining what deep earth orbit meant mm -hmm. uh, in terms of regulatory because the, the regulations that they had did not apply to our company because every uh, space uh, business right now is focused on low, low earth orbit or earth observation companies. They don't have someone on the map like us that's planning on deep space missions um, other than Voyager and the red Tesla, there isn't anything else happening in deep space right now. <laughs> so, so it's really um, interesting that we find ourselves saying, well, as we plan out our business and our timelines, we don't want to find out that when we're ready for Space Act agreement and we're ready to, to file for Spectrum that we can't go. 
So, so these conversations have to happen early and they have to happen often. And it's interesting how many business cards I have from people in Washington that say, you know, I'm on the ground and I can help you on a daily basis, visiting, uh, visiting Congress and visiting senators and meeting with all these offices. And that's, that's great, uh, but I think just because we are, um, like any company, you have to be strategic with your resources, we're, we're defining our own strategy in that, in that vein to say how do we do this most efficiently and effectively. We've been super uh, fortunate to meet some of the decision makers that are independent entities that are providing comments to our government leaders to help form that policy and we now have a relationship with them so there's a discussion and we can have our inputs heard which is really exciting. So I'm, I couldn't be more positive about the opportunity and um, we, just, we just came back on a high. Um, personally speaking with Bridenstine and Scott Pace, it's, they're, they're the leaders and it's trickling down to everyone that's, that's going to make this happen and that's really exciting. That's great, no thank you. So I think we should spend a little bit of time talking about the fundamentals of investment, like the types of criteria investors look for, what are the exit patterns for investors, how do investors make money. So I thought we'd start that discussion on the best part of that equation, is how investors make money. So um, exits. And I'd like for uh, Buddy and maybe Sunil to comment on this. And Buddy, if you want to jump in right now regarding what are the uh, how can you best give an overview of the exit scenarios for investors? And maybe you can use Titan or someone else as an example for the audience. Sure. Um, you know, it, the, the, for those that are not intimately familiar with the model of investing in venture capital, um, it, is, um, it is a high risk alternative asset class. The expectation as a uh, early stage investors that you'll place a number of bets and if history is any um, indication of success at least the well run funds will see about a third of their investments going to zero a third of their investments returning 50 cents on the dollar on the dollar uh, and a third will be the winners um, and hopefully they're significant enough winners to pr drive the whole portfolio to perform well um, you know, a, a, a top quartile venture fund will produce three to five X returns over the course of the fund's life, which is a 10 year life. Um, in the world of exits, um, there's been historically two main sources of exits, and I'd say a third that has surfaced over the last eight or nine, 10 years. Um, the two main sources are the company goes public and creates a public market for the sale of its stock or it gets acquired. And um, the vast majority of exits in, in, that, in the industry have been through M&A, sales of the company, as opposed to creation of public market. The third type of liquidity that has surfaced over the last decade is a secondary sale. There has become an ever-increasing market out there of buyers interested in sell buying secondary positions in private companies. And hopefully that source of capital will continue, because I think it's driven uh, a nice amount of additional liquidity uh, into uh, into um, private company, in particular venture capital. Um, my experience, um, you know, I've, I've worked with lots of different companies as a lawyer, as an investor, um, and then going through my own exits um, with Titan. Um, it's a, uh, it, it is, um, you know, if if I were talking to just entrepreneurs in the audience, I would say that uh, there's. I, I've rarely witnessed an entrepreneur from day one that tries to build a company with the sole intention of selling it. Um, that uh, that, that uh, has, at least in my experience, been sort of the wrong focal point. Um, uh, the right focal point is building a company that is addressing a market need um, and hopefully a market that is dynamic um, and changing. And if I look at what we've been talking about here with New Space, uh, I think there is a strong perception, I think the reality is still a question mark, but I'm a believer, a strong perception that what we're all working on uh, has profound implications and uh, is a market that is expanding at a rate that uh, produces a lot of uh, uh, increasing opportunities. So um, I don't know if that at least set the stage for the discussion. Oh, absolutely. No, thank you. That's great. Um, 
So Sunil, what uh, if, if you were to, I know there's not a, a simplistic way of expressing the criteria that investors look for in a potential investment, but uh, I'm going to ask you anyway. So what are the simple criteria, if there are any, mm -hmm. on how you evaluate investments? Mm -hmm. And uh, are there any threshold, um, thresholds that you look for? Like uh, are, there pre, are there things that, you, that are must-haves? And if one of those must-haves is not available, it's a no deal. Uh, yeah, so I will answer that in 10 seconds. I want to reaffirm yep. uh, what Buddy said. Uh, at Bessemer, where I was for six years, we did we crunch the numbers, and it's really one out of 10 that produces all the returns. Uh, so very much up, up the alley, you were saying, Buddy. And then on exits, uh, you were saying that, you know, um, conceptually you shouldn't build for an exit. Um, also, aiming for the right kind of company that you're exiting to is also a, uh, a tricky exercise. Um, one company I was involved with at Bessemer, Twitch, the esports gaming platform, I handed them their term sheet at their, basically their Series A. And uh, uh, when we did that, the Bessemer discussion, uh, we, we tended to have a section on how this might exit. Would it be IPO or M&A? And we named some companies. 50 smart investors, one of the world's best VC firms, not a single person mentioned Amazon as the acquirer, right? <laughs> and so it just reaffirms you, you never know uh, how these things are, exit, when they'll exit, how they'll exit, because uh, the world's changing so fast. Uh, with regard to investment criteria, I tend to um, try to use a very simple framework in my head. Uh, I'll tell you the wrong framework. The wrong framework is uh, if you pitch me on an idea, a new lawn mowing service using an autonomous lawnmower, let's say, uh, the, the, there's a natural tendency to say, oh, I would never use that, that's stupid. Right? That, that's completely the wrong framework. Um, a, a much better framework uh, consists of three simple questions. Uh, does anybody want it? Are there a lot of those people and can you find them? Mm. Uh, and, and they correspond to uh, more complicated uh, and, and jargony concepts around product market fit, uh, market size, TAM, SAM, and unit economics, CAC, LTV. But leaving all that aside, uh, in my business with, with seed stage investing, where I'm investing in a company that's usually less than a year old, has one or two employees, I'm focusing all my energy on does anybody want it? Uh, is there some human that you're not related to that has said, yes, I really, really, really want that product. Right. And it sounds like a really simple hurdle, but uh, I meet about a thousand companies a year, I invest in four or five, uh, and against that backdrop, maybe 80% of that are not, uh, are not able to even broach that topic in a one hour presentation. <laughs> it, it, it's, it is a natural tension between look what we can build versus look who wants it. And usually in more technical areas where many of us focus, the, there's a pressure on uh, the founder, uh, uh, um, founders' capabilities come from look what we can build. So look, I'm sure if I build hyperspectral satellites, I know people will want it. Of course they will want it. It'll increase their yields by 3% or 30%. Why wouldn't they want it? Is a totally different line of thinking of, I called Jim, he's a farmer, he said he would buy it from me tomorrow if I had it for $200 per acre. Right, that's a total, and that, put, uh, getting that data point. So at least at the seed stage, it's, it's product market fit, specifically, does anyone want it? Uh, later on, uh, this often corresponds with Series A and B, but uh, later on, showing that there's a lot of people that want it uh, can be more precisely manifested as I have uh, representative customers in a few different verticals or in a few different incarnations or a few different geographies. I'm doing this picture because I'm thinking you get dots on the map. So I have small business, big business, uh, Asia, US, but having customers. And then finally, uh, uh, can you find them? Uh, it really has to do with the sales model. Is the sales cycle short enough? Are there enough leads? When you pay a salesperson $200,000, does that result in enough gross margin to offset their salary with it? And those are, those are Series B, Series C metrics uh, that, that people spend time on. But I think for most of the um, nascent ideas, and nascent means uh, you don't have tons of customers going yet, the focus really is on um, prove definitively and, and, uh, and un undeniably that people are jumping up and down to have this product. Uh, and my own startup in 2009 failed because I never found that kind of product market fit. I should have focused on that more than the other stuff down the road. I, I would add, uh, for us, the simple answer is uh, great team, great market opportunity is sort of the simple answer. Uh, I'd say if you kind of look at the data, we kind of get the same kind of numbers that you probably do in uh, and that you do, Lisa, in, on a weekly basis. And so you, if you look at those, you know, I'd say probably 10% of the, of the stuff we see is a great management team with a really stupid idea uh, or, or a really crazy, like, whack job. Mm -hmm. Why are you guys doing this? There's no customers. There's no market but they're geniuses and you're like, why are you guys wasting your time on this? <laughs> you see that most of it, unfortunately, the other sort of 80, you know, 4% or whatever, 80, 78% or whatever that's left, uh, you know, is uh, a management team that frankly just doesn't have the stuff to carry out the expectations of the business, even though they found a wonderful business opportunity. Uh, and we always use a couple of tests, so this might be helpful for, for entrepreneurs in the room. We use a couple of tests of entrepreneurs all the time. We say, first of all, 
uh, have you raised any money from friends and family? Because if you can't raise money from people that know you, you sure as hell aren't going to raise money from people that don't. <laughs> and so uh, have, can you raise money from friends and family and have you? And secondly, can you attract anybody else with any real skills and capabilities to work for free like you do for the next year or two? Because if you can't find anybody else to sign up for your mission the way you are, you're probably on your own and very few startups are single family, single founder, on your own, be able to create a great company. It usually takes a team to do that. And if you can't and find somebody else that you can in excite with your passion to sign up for the same things you're signing up for, it's highly unlikely you're gonna be able to build a great team. So. Okay. Peter, let, let me reinforce that. Um, I had a big Ubiquity event with investors from Lux, Bessemer, and Excel, and all of them said that was one of the single most important things was recruiting. Uh, and all, I had all my founders there, and they were all shocked by that. They thought, oh, it was about LOIs and contracts, yeah. but um, it, it might be helpful to have a mental model of an investor as someone who is uh, one inch deep across a lot of things. That means they, they know almost nothing about what you're doing. And so um, having, um, showing them signals that, uh, 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 that are proxies like, hey, this is the right direction. Smart people are following me into this. Smart money is following me into this can often be a, a really, really strong signal as opposed to just going into the weeds of lox kerosene mixture ratios and things like that. Um, but because frankly, most investors, you know, you'll, there'll be a few, maybe 10 that understand that, but a thousand understand, hey, this person was at the lox kerosene propulsion best company and they came over to you and this investor came over to you. So kind of creating that aura, but building on a strong foundation yeah. through recruiting. And then the last thing I'd say is we spend a lot of our time, a lot of our companies, where we say, look, go get it from customers. You know, a dollar from, an, from a customer is worth 10 times what a dollar from an investor is worth, right? And a lot of people look at us and go, well, you're an investor. Why would you say it? Well, because we think that's the best thing for you. Uh, and so you'd be shocked at how many customers, if you really have a value proposition that sings, if you really have something of value, uh, you'd be shocked at what people will do to prepay or pay in advance for exclusivity or rights or time frames or something where you get basically free capital uh, that is in essence improving the valuation of your company while you're also getting capital in. So uh, that's the last, th uh, last point I make on that. Yeah, buddy. I'll yes. add one more comment which may be embellishing what um, my colleagues have shared. Um, and that is specificity of, of intention. And what I mean by that is, I'll give you a quick story. The, the two founders of Trulia visited my office way back when as they were coming out of business school. And they had this idea of building an online service that would help home buyers um, buy, find and buy their homes more cost effectively or more quickly, more efficiently. And as they were sharing it with me, they shared uh, the following story. They said, you know what, you're looking for a f home, you want to see a picture of the home, you want to see the tax records, you'd like to know what uh, homes in the neighborhood have sold for recently. You'd like to find what the schools are like, maybe a police report or crime report. You'd like all that information. And, oh, by the way, this is 10 years or so ago. All that information is online, but it's in disparate places. Um, so we, the Trulia founders, are going to build a single site where all that information is organized in one clear shot for the home buyer. And as they were talking through what they were planning to do, I started building in my own mind a picture of their website. I mean, they were so specific about what they were intending to do that I could actually visualize it. They came back 30 days later and shared with me their wireframes. And I kid you not, it was exactly what I had envisioned when, they, when we met the prior month. And that specificity, that certainty around what they were going to build, led me to write a check and bring other people into that financing. And um, lo and behold, it turned out to be a very successful business. And that same specificity, that same maniacal prioritization of the initial steps of the business have been repeated on a number of other companies that I've worked with that I'm happy to share. And that, as an entrepreneur, is I think what you really need to do in the early stages. Know exactly where you're going and explain why and how. And I think with that confidence and that clarity, investors are going to be more inclined to join your party. Great. Thanks for that, buddy. So I'm going to, I would like to discuss two more quick topics before we open up uh, questions from the <coughs> audience. So please think of uh, interesting questions to ask. We may have time for a couple of questions from the audience. Before we do that, uh, Vincent, can you quickly comment? Stop. Can we? It's 12.30. <laughs> okay. I thought we had until 12.30, no? Maybe? They're queuing us the stop sign. They're so okay, uh, well, I'm the moderator, so we're going to do one more quick topic here. So, um, Thank you. Can you, Vincent, can you quickly comment on the distinction between the investment ecosystem and community in Europe versus the United States? What differences do you see or any similarities that you see? Well, I think fundamentally there is um, an entrepreneurial spirit that is uh, just different between the continents. So it's uh, slowly building up and uh, you may or you may not hear about all the, the press in Europe about 
you know, building more uh, tech hubs, uh, bringing more money, and so on and so forth. But I would say the fundamental uh, issue we, we still have a bit in Europe is uh, to, to make the bridge between the startup stage and the scale up. So you have a lot of very nice uh, startup which get the early funding, but it's much harder, I would say, than in the US to, uh, to scale up. Um, for the rest of it, I guess, uh, you know, if you have time to, uh, to come to other places other than, uh, than the US and come to Europe, I think there are great companies, there are great hubs and so on and so forth, but we are still a bit uh, trailing behind, I would say. Um, you just asked me about uh, Europe, but I think there is a place where uh, I think it's not so easy to talk about it here, but I will still talk about it. It's uh, China. And China, to me, is the real contender today. Um, you know, like they have done in uh, other fields, um, I'm a bit, uh, well, not scared, but uh, still a bit. Uh, they are coming very strong over there. And they are already well organized for uh, the investment and so on and so forth. Um, I was just mentioning the kind of uh, public par public private partnerships you have in the US. I think they are really good at uh, doing the same over there. Mm -hmm. And just to give you a figure that I learned recently, which I found absolutely astonishing. I mean, we talk about the number of uh, you know propulsion companies or small sat companies around the world. I, I, I learned recently. I think they are between something like. 30 and 50, so 3050 zero, zero small sat manufacturers just in China alone. So it gives the scale of and magnitude of uh, you know what's going on there. And uh, so I diverge from your question, but uh, I That's think it's worth point. having it in mind. That's China. a very good point. Were any of you at the Disrupt Space Conference in Beijing um, earlier this year? Anyone? So what I, I unfortunately couldn't make it, but uh, the number of new space companies that Vincent was talking about, he alluded to it, there are more new space companies at least uh, being developed and, and getting investment either from government or private sources in China than the United States. And across all sectors, across all sectors, including some pure play application software analytics companies as well. So uh, we're going to get a question, uh, I'm sorry, we'll get audience participation in a second, but I wanted uh, to give Lisa a chance uh, to discuss what sectors you like in our industry. And maybe you can use that to kind of almost summarize or wrap up our panel on a, on a positive note. What looks promising to you? What are you excited about within the new space industry? Sure, well, we, I think we've mentioned a few days ago we were talking about the manufacturing in space opportunity. That's a little farther out, but uh, at uh, Secure World Forum the other week, we were talking about um, planetary debris and that the orbital debris, excuse me, orbital debris problem. I find it interesting. Um, situational awareness companies, I find them interesting. I don't think they've quite figured out uh, the problem of uh, grabbing a piece of junk in space that doesn't uh, disintegrate when you touch it and then cause all sorts of problems uh, as a result. Uh, so these are things that I just find uh, uh, um, fascinating, but we, we have uh, companies that are working on software for satellites. Um, they could be the, the windows of the future, uh, you know, the, and so we see those um, taking off because companies want the data from space. They don't necessarily want to produce the hardware. They just want that information. Mm -hmm. So the closer we can get to getting that for them and shortening that cycle, I think, is, is b the better. Um, we talk about, we talk to companies that are uh, promising to download data at super fast rates. We find that interesting. Um, the question is how you do it and does the math check out? Uh, but down leaking and the ability to um, have ground stations receive all this, these massive amounts of data that will be exploding in the future is, is a big topic and I think something to look into. Uh, so there are so many categories that are emerging in space right now uh, beyond the future category that I know Peter loves, which is biotech in space. Uh, basically, all of my biotech companies uh, have uh, the potential for a space component because if we're going to be living and working in space, we need to be eating in space. So we have cellular, ag cellular agriculture companies that are growing food from stem cells. This isn't unusual. It's like beer, beer ch uh, cheese, and, and we've been making those by fermenting um, 
uh, for thousands of years, so now we're going to use cellular agriculture to grow our food in space. So there's so much um, opportunity for research. Pharma is interested in space. I mean, there's a lot that has to happen. Um, growing food, um, creating a ph the pharmaceutical opportunity, metal alloys are interesting, the opportunity to create new materials in space that are twice the strength and half the weight, things that can be produced in microgravity that can bind in microgravity but they, they can't be made on earth. Um, we love to talk about Z-Bland, that's a fun topic of fiber optic cable that doesn't require repeaters and financial sector loves this idea because if you can transmit that information across the continents uh, in, in record uh, time, you can maybe cut some time on a, on a financial transaction and make a lot of money. So there's a lot of opportunities for taking that data and profiting from it. Um, Earth observation, I didn't even talk about that topic, but the ability to look at oil moving through a pipeline or the, the changes in a forest where um, you can identify someone that's siphoning gas, uh, some marauder that's siphoning gas from Shell uh, on a daily basis, costing them mil millions of dollars. There's uh, so many applications for this, I guess you could say, omnipotent view of the Earth from space. And what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. And who can benefit from that? And how do we, we start with the general information because it's not going to be as rich, but those data insights companies that yep. figure it out will be the long-term winners, I think. I completely agree. So exciting time to be alive. The next five to 10 years is going to bring some fun stuff. So with that, any questions from the audience? Yes, we may have roaming mics, I hope, possibly. Yes, awesome. thank you. Hi, thanks so much for making the time today, um, all the panelists. Um, so at the really rapid pace of innovation that's happening, particularly in new space, um, the panelists mentioned the importance of flexibility for these new space companies. But I was just wondering if, um, Buddy, you could address how does that really reconcile with that specificity of intention that you outlined in, um, in terms of building the attractiveness of a company for investors in new space? Yeah, neat question. Thank you. Good question. Um, I, the, the, I don't know if this is unique to the new space sector or any tech sector. Um, you know, the, the opportunity that, that we look at at an early stage investment is um, dynamic, growing market, and then what's the sort of pivotal opportunity to take advantage of in that new expanding or uh, dynamic market. And um, one thing that's, that's ubiquitous amongst startups is that they have scarce resources. Um, and as an investor to those startups, um, it's critical for uh, me to see that they're going to use those scarce resources as efficiently as possible. And uh, so the moment that the check gets deposited into the startup's bank account, I want to know that they're going to use that capital as efficiently as possible and create as much value as possible with that capital. And that requires that before that check, or the, the precondition to depositing that check in the startup's account is to know exactly what they're going to do and make sure that their, their thoughts uh, have been sort of carefully vetted, carefully uh, planned. Um, and so optimal efficiency on deploying their, the, their capital is, is paramount to me giving them that capital. Um, so yes, markets change quickly. Um, and, um, and, and once a startup is up and running, they need to be you know, prescient enough or self-aware enough to make changes along the way. Um, but I'm a firm believer that the best entrepreneurs look at these dynamic markets and see a very clear path to opportunity and plan to execute on that path. And when given the capital, then quickly sprint in that direction. Sometimes they're wrong. And as an investor, sometimes I'm wrong. Um, but I'm betting on that path that they're articulating to me. I'm not betting that they're going to first get into the market and then figure it out. Great. Uh, Jeff, you got a question there. I wanted to go back to the issue of exits because we had arguably had one last week with Virgin right. Galactic uh, merging with a special purpose acquisition company. Do you see that sort of opening the floodgates to similar deals for space companies in the future, or is that sort of a one-off event for Virgin? Great question. Yeah. Who, who would like to take that? Sunil should take it. We talked about it. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Go for I'm it. I'm bad with yeah. you. I mean, uh, 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 Why don't you start, Peter? Yeah, I, I don't think there's yeah. any question that there's 
anytime you see an industry go through a growth phase, uh, you're going to see a consolidation and shakeout phase, right? And so uh, you heard me talk yesterday about the cannabis industry where you're either a consolidator preparing to be consolidated or roadkill. Uh, I don't think space is there yet. I don't think it's that far along yet. But I don't think there's any question that as people run out of money and the customers don't show up as much as they thought they would or the market wasn't what they maybe thought in the first place, there's going to be mergers, there's going to be more and more consolidation. Eventually, uh, every one of the spaces, like every, every uh, segment in every industry, will end up with you know, a, a handful of players that are the key dominant players and a handful of niche players that you know, are eating away at little parts of them. So eventually when you go from you know 15 1600 whatever it is 2000 companies in the in space in general to how many are going to be actually alive and running in each market you know you probably have a handful in each that are going to be the survivors and uh, and that usually means mass consolidation and mass uh, uh, road kill is what ends up happening as you go through that but. Um. So let me start by saying I think Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit, I think are um, fantastic companies with great leaders. Um, independent of that is sort of the financing structure that, that's come about. Um, my understanding is that, that Virgin Galactic has raised uh, X amount of money. I think it's 500 or 700 million dollars. And this reverse IPO values the existing company at below that. So normally we'd say it's below liquidation preferences. Uh, and so um, from a financing perspective, uh, you raise money when you can, how you can. Um, and so I think that's great that they'll have an injection of capital. Uh, I think that their mission is a worthwhile one and they're still working on their business. I think that's great. Uh, the Chamath piece makes it completely one off. Um, Chamath is a failed venture capitalist whose who's, who's, who's venture capital firm fell, fell apart in front of him. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate that, 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 that this is coming about with his involvement, the reverse IPO piece. I think it detracts from uh, Virgin's otherwise noble mission. Um, I hope that uh, through going public, they can now attract uh, more investors, have a broader float and diversify their investor base. Uh, but I don't view uh, Chamat's involvement or the reverse IPO structure as one that is particularly attractive to a lot of startups or uh, one that I will, uh, I don't predict it'll be repeated uh, through his organization or, or through others uh, very often. There might be one more, one more like that, but I don't view that as, a, um, as the ideal path uh, and, and one that anyone should chase after. I 100% agree with what you just said. I, I don't think it's a model for the industry, um, although it's good for the company right now. I'd rather have it seen uh, specifically apply for Virgin Orbit uh, only um, as a separate entity. But um, anyway, that's too much on that. So we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, sir. Oh. Uh, a question about orbital debris. Yep. Uh, which is really, really important. Uh, where do they, who are the customers and where do they come from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> who are the customers? Uh -huh. well, where? It's orbital an, debris. It's an interesting yeah. topic because the governments are talking about um, bonding together to make this a requirement so that we don't lose um, uh, expensive satellites in the future so that it's a it's a like a an effort that everyone uh, some people talked about t taxing people that have too much degree and how do we manage it so how is it a world a, a global effort to say we have to manage this I heard a lot of talk from the Iridium folks that are kind of the reason we have a lot of this orbital <laughs> de degree and they were um, uh, working on I think deorbiting their 58th satellite something like that and um, uh, that's all great uh, but if you look at the maps of the debris you say wow um, okay we have to figure out this problem and what is what is the market uh, for it is it is it acquiring um, materials and if you if you acquire these valuable materials that are in space and and bring it back to earth what are you doing with it I I don't have the answer to that question but I know that the problem exists so there is a market so you know did junk in space what do we do with it it's all valuable junk I don't know it's a good question and I haven't seen anyone that has an answer yet 
Um, so, oh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I believe there's rules if you're going to be in orbit for over 25 years, you need to have a plan. If you're in geo, you have to sort of back your way out to the graveyard orbit. I, I hope with um, fantastic companies like Leo Labs that are offering more precision about what's out there without having to do a lot of extra work just with terrestrial um, radar, uh, that we'll be able to enforce higher regulations rather than say, if your orbital predictions are that you won't deorbit naturally in 25 years, instead we could be more precise and say, oh, if you're going to launch something before you get a license, uh, that you need to ensure that, that you won't come within this range. I think Leo Labs is trying to narrow the spatial and temporal window. Um, but um, beyond that, I, th I think there's the, the elephant in the room, which is most of the debris is from anti-satellite tests. Yeah. And I don't know what the heck you do about that. Uh, and, and, and I don't know that these companies, you know, there's no energetically efficient way to capture tiny bits of pieces that are in so many different orbits. But the, the recent anti-satellite test, the, the Chinese test, even um, that's like, I don't know, I think 75% of the debris right now. So I think with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. So if anyone has additional questions, please feel free to approach the panelists afterwards. We, I believe, have lunch now with an, a very amazing key asset of our industry keynote. So uh, with that, please join me in congratulating and thanking our panelists, please. Thank you.